Hi folks, welcome to trailer video number 19, The Distinti Time Dilation Paradox, where I'm going to prove to you that time dilation is not the effect that we're seeing. Okay, so the phenomenon called time dilation, there is something occurring. There is an effect that we're observing, and it looks like time dilation. It smells like time dilation. It probably even tastes like time dilation, but it is nothing to do with time. It is not an affectation of time. And I will prove that to you with a very simple paradox. Then I will show you what that phenomenon truly is, because I'm going to get the same answer that classical physics get using something completely different. So here's the agenda. First, I'm going to talk about the CRT electron beam scattering problem. That's going to be the foundation of the, the explanation and the explanation of the paradox. Then I'm going to show the classical explanation of why an electron beam doesn't scatter, and it's based on the old concept of time dilation. Then I'm going to derive the classical equation based on that classical explanation. And then I'm going to introduce the distinti time paradox, which I can show you that the electron beam cannot possibly be under the effect of time dilation. Then I'm going to derive the same equation using magnetism, using the corrected reference frame of magnetism from the other distinti paradox video, video number T6A. I will put the links in this in the low bar. Okay, and I guarantee you this will blow your mind. So let's talk about the electron beam scattering problem. What you see in front of you is a picture of an oscilloscope. And that little green trace you see is caused by an electron beam hitting a phosphor film on the inside of the cathode ray tube. And this is a, a bigger version that you would see in a television set. So what you have is you have an electron gun that shoots a beam of electrons through a vacuum that hit a little green phosphor coating on the other side of the screen and that produces a little point of green light that you see. Now these coils over here are used to steer the beam around so you can paint any kind of picture, whether that be a television picture, an oscilloscope picture, whatever, whatever, whatever. Now one of the questions that always comes up in engineering school is, wait a minute, this beam of electrons is under Coulomb forces. Electrons want to repel from each other. So why doesn't this beam just automatically diffuse what keeps it together? And the classical thing that we're told in engineering school, it's time dilation. Okay. So, let's look at the close-up of the electron beam. Now, the electron beam is not a single row of electrons moving from left to right in our example here, because a single solitary row of electrons would not make a point big enough that you could possibly see. At least, I don't think it could. So our electron beam has a definite width to it, but it didn't matter. It could be a, it, you know, it, it, this, it, it could be smaller, but it's going to have some width to it. Okay, and so we could pick the, we're going to pick these two charges here that are moving together with velocity v. Now I could pick two charges in this orientation, but then we have to kind of consider length contraction as part of it. I want to use something so we can avoid considering length contraction, because that's just going to make the calculations a little bit more complicated. So we're going to pick, show the, the, these two charges moving transverse. Okay, so here is the classical Coulomb's model. Now I don't say Coulomb's law, because that's a misnomer. We're, when scientists call something a law, it's not really a law because we have this constant of relation here, which really means this is an empirical fit of data. This is not really a law. This really doesn't explain much, but it is a well-known and well-understood model. No problem there. This is the time dilation model over here. And again, the reason why I chose two transverse oriented electrons is I want to have, avoid having to account for length contraction, make the calculation simpler. And because this, the forces along this direction are maximum is with regard to the scattering effect that we should see. So now one of the problems, oh, I can go back a second. So one of the problems here is when I've seen this calculation done in, in other places, I'm not going to mention names where, 
they just take this and just multiply this by this or the inverse of this or something like that. I've seen so many really bad derivations of this. The reason why you can't just apply this to this is because this is force. And force represents something that's accelerating, okay? Force is equal to mass times acceleration, okay? So we have to speak in terms of how do we adjust acceleration for time dilation? Well, let's do the, the well-known equation that the distance an object travel is one-half the acceleration times time squared. And then let's solve for acceleration. Then we get this equation here. Okay, we want to make another copy of this equation for a time dilated version of acceleration where we're going to put the dilated time in here. Now we're going to take the ratio of the time accelerated acceleration to the normal acceleration. We're going to multiply this ratio against our force equation when we get back to it. So if we take this equation and divide by this equation, we end up with this. Okay, then we can substitute this equation and the delta t, that, that works for this as well because we're considering very small instances of time here. Okay, so that, that's not a mismatch with the deltas. And but when we do that, so our conversion, our time dilated acceleration is going to be, when you, when you re reciprocate and square this, it's going to be 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so now we're going to multiply this times Coulomb's model. And that's what we end up with. Okay, so this is the proper way to apply time dilation to the electron beam using classical theory. And what this means is, is that this force between these two charges, the closer you get to the speed of light, this force tends to go to zero. Okay, that's what this equation means. Now, remember this equation, because we're going to get to this equation not using time dilation. We're going to get to it from a very different other method. But first, we got to talk about the distinti time paradox so that I can show you that this here is not cause the cause. Time dilation is not the cause. Okay, but let me talk about some other things about time dilation that I really don't care for. First of all, physicists have properly rationalized that an effect that looks like time dilation, smells like time dilation, time dilation must exist. I have no problem with that. Okay, the problem is that they stop there. They didn't bother to go figure out, well, what causes it? They just apply it. And, and, and as much as Einstein complained about quantum mechanics as spooky action at a distance, well, I'm sorry. If you don't explain what the mechanism of time dilation is, then you have spooky action for no reason at all. That's worse. And it violates locality because you're not explaining how it's occurring. What is the mechanism that causes a moving object to experience it? That is totally ignored. Physicists just ignore that and they go about their merry way. And that pisses me off. And it violates locality. That's part of that. So we'll, we'll fix these issues with the distinct heat derivation. On to the paradox. So let's go back to the electron tube. So what we say here using the time dilation explanation is that this electron beam is traveling at such a high speed that the clock, so the little electrons that make up this beam are slower than the clocks for all the material that makes up the rest of this CRT system. So what they're saying is what they're saying is that these electrons that are making up this beam are not passing into the future at the same rate that the screen is. So the screen is moving into the future faster than the electrons are. And so how is it ever that the electrons are going to catch up to the screen? There should be no image on the screen at all because the electrons are passing into the past and they will never catch up to the future where the screen is. And so there should be no spot on the phosphor. Now, I know what the physicists will say. Time doesn't work that way. And they'll spew all kinds of gibberish. And when you boil it down, they will have to claim that all of these time reference frames coexist at the same time, which is kind of an oxymoron. Okay, but the key here is that they will strain to keep the gibberish in the context of time. And in so doing, they will have to explain that multiple time frames can coexist simultaneously at the same time. 
But this would contradict quantum electrodynamics, which needs electrons coming from the future to make their equations work. And in quantum electrodynamics, this future does not coexist with the past. You can't have two contradictory understandings of time. One where all the elements, all the frames of time coexist, and another one where the frames of time are separate and isolated. That is a contradiction. You cannot have two contradictory understandings of time. So time dilation is not what's going on here. Cannot be. So let me show you the ethereal mechanics derivation. Part of ethereal mechanics is new electromagnetism. These equations are about 20 years old. I will have a link for the foundation playlist where you can go and find out where these come from. Now, in here we have zero order effects, first order effects, and second order effects, which, are, which is acceleration. So we're not going to consider new induction in this equation. We are going to consider a Coulomb's model because that, that's what the first order effects are. I'm sorry, the zero order effects. And then we are going to consider a component of magnetism here. But which component of magnetism? Well, let's look at magnetism a little closer. These two terms, number two and number four, are derived from F equal QV cross B using the concept that a magnetic field is stationary with respect to the medium. It's an emission. That's what we did. That's what we showed you on the first distinti paradox. Okay, and that's what these two terms come from. This term is a term I had to add in order to make, well, I'm not going to get into that. Let me just say that for the purposes of this demonstration is that in order for these terms to be non-zero, the velocity of the charges have to be along the direction of the radial between them, and they are not. They are orthogonal. So these two terms go to zero. So the only thing you have left is this term and Coulomb's model. So let's sum terms one and four. These numbers I give are the terms numbers just to keep them track, just to keep them separate. So let's sum the terms one and four. Here's term one, here's term four. Okay, so we're going to add them. And this is what you get when you add them. Now, Km can be replaced with Ke divided by C squared. And so that's what this is. is that's the only step here. Okay, now we can factor the Ke out. And we'll slide the C under. And because the velocities of the charges are parallel, and they're the same velocity, this dot product can be replaced by V squared. Now look at that. We got the exact same answer without using time dilation. Magnetism is the cause of what we've been calling time dilation, but it's not a dilation in time. It's what we call, what ethereal mechanics calls process dilation. In other words, your materials, excuse me, slow down relative to their velocity with their medium. And because it's the velocity, the interaction in the medium, we no longer violate causality. And because we have a causal explanation, it's a simple magnetic field effect, there's no more spooky action without any reason at all. And because we understand the mechanism here, it's not this spooky, it's just a simple, simple mechanics of regular Newtonian mechanics, just with a little electromagnetism installed. That everything, what I can show in my transvariance paper is that everything in relativity can be derived down to electromagnetism from inertia, gravity, everything. So now, if you want to dive deeper, you can look at the early ethereal mechanics paper titled newgravity.pdf. How do you find that? Well, you go to my website, Okay, www.distinti.com, and you go down here to the Ethereal Mechanics page, you click on it, and then somewhere down here you'll find multiple places the link to the paper called newgravity.pdf. It's in like five or six different places. Okay, in there you're going to see a treasure trove of things I derived 20 years ago. Things that were really amazing and that you can use, that came about with a simplified model of matter and new electromagnetism. And I have a model of matter that you can explain black holes, the whole nine yards. Well, not all whole nine yards. There are missing pieces that we're going to explain in the future papers. Now, the, the 
First paper, the formal paper of release is transvariance, which you can find here. There's the PDF. This shows there's a lot of things that relativity freaking missed. There's more compensations you need for the Michelson-Morley experiment and the physicists. I don't know what they were doing, but they did not do their proper due diligence on that. The second paper of ethereal mechanics is constructs. I'll let you read that on your own. The third paper, the static gravity models are going to be out hopefully by the end of the year. And then we have more papers in the pipeline, but these may change depending on how these papers roll out. Because this paper was going to be electrogravity, but got it so big, I had to separate it into smaller papers. Now, please... Please help us out, okay, because one of the things I show is that unless the human race can, we have to derive 500 times the speed of light or we're going to perish. There is no if, ands, or buts about this. There's no other way around this. We are, the technology to keep living on this planet with dwindling resources is not going to work forever and ever and ever. We need to expand into space. And I have a good argument that we need to cut, unless we get 500 times the speed of light, we just as might as well just have a war and get it over right now. And the human stupidity right now. So help us out. I have a, I have a Patreon. I, got a, I work full time to support Ethereal Mechanics. Uh, my Patreon folks have been with me and some have been with me for 20 years. Matter of fact, my Patreon folks have known about this paradox for over a year. Okay, so please help out. Join now, anyway, it really helped me out because then I can do this full time and produce a lot better stuff a lot quicker and maybe even hire people to do some of the videos, which would be really nice. I'd love to be able to make Veritasium quality videos, uh, but with the little time I have, I'm sorry, it's just not possible. I need your help. Okay, so there's my begging and pleading. Okay, the next video is going to be the Paradox 2 and Paradox 3 experiments to show that there are more terms to magnetism. Okay, new electromagnetism V3, V4 are, will be replaced because the Paradox 2 and Paradox 3 experiments have made me realize that we're missing rotational terms of magnetism. They work fine for translational forms of electromagnetic interactions, but there's rotational forms that were only brought to my attention through the Paradox experiments. Okay, and I already talked about that last one. So, so the Paradox 2 and Paradox 3 are going to be released next. We're going to show that there are more terms to magnetism that cannot be explained by classical theory or even new electromagnetism. That's why we're going to have a version 5 release that will cover the new terms that uh, we will find when we finally reduce the results from the Paradox 2 and Paradox 3. Anyway, thank you. Share this with everybody. This means relativity and quantum mechanics are essentially dead dead in the water. And when I release the Paradox 2 and Paradox 3, I'll be putting another set of torpedoes into those failing sciences, which have gotten nowhere, nowhere in 60 years. Because one of the fundamental problems is that relativity talks up gravity, but they don't have a model of matter. Because you have to have a model of matter to show how gravity reacts to, to, to matter and how matter creates gravity. But they don't. They just have this little thing called matter. It's a constant they throw into the equation. And then on the other side, you have quantum mechanics, which tries to develop a model for matter, but they don't explain gravity. And this impasse has been going on for 60 years. Ethereal mechanics solves the problem. We have a model of matter that shows how ma and gravity is de de developed and how gravity couples to matter. So we're the real deal. Ethereal mechanics is the real deal. Anyway, I will stop bothering you with this because I got more videos to make. And I will get up to making releases for Patreon only in about a week or so. Thank you very much.